Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening here in India. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, host this session on how people like our speaker, uh, Prasanna, helped to create the medical devices industry in India. I quickly had a chance to look at people who are on the call, and I see some old names and friends. Prasanna, some of our friends from the old times are also in the audience. So a special welcome mm -hmm. to all of you. Um, and uh, I'm sure in the course of the discussion, many of you will probably have something to say. Uh, Prasanna has a very distinguished background. He's done so many things in the course of his long career, a lot of which he has uh, chronicled in this uh, book, Innovate Locally to Win Globally. Uh, I had the privilege of writing the foreword for the book. And that's when I, see, I saw that uh, uh, the things that I know Prasanna to have done, uh, I saw them in a new light because uh, I saw that they have lessons for uh, everyone else, uh, not just uh, everyone in India, but in everyone in uh, all around the world who may have an interest in uh, economic development, technological uh, development in the emerging markets. So I invite Prasanna to talk about his long career in industry, in GE, in uh, joint venture with uh, GE called Wipro GE, and uh, many other things he's done subsequently by way of uh, uh, startups as an investor, as a venture capitalist, uh, and also as a philanthropist. So a great pleasure to welcome my former uh, classmate in the MBA program many, many <laughs> decades ago and good friend, uh, D.A. Prasanna. Prasanna, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind very quickly sketching uh, giving us a thumbnail sketch of your uh, professional career uh, over the years, so we so the audience all knows uh, how they can uh, best uh, pick your brains. Thank you, Prasanna, for joining us today, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ravi Ramurthy. Thanks to Center for Emerging Markets and to the Northeastern University for giving me uh, giving me this platform to share with uh, the attendees around this call um, some of my experience which uh, may have interest for you and interest uh, in your context. Now, Ravi, going to uh, answer your question, I was Executive Vice President uh, Human Resource and Strategy in Wipro. Our business, our star business was computers. And every three years, technology would change in the computer industry, posing risk. If you made some wrong bets, uh, companies would go down and it was a common, uh, common phenomenon in the Silicon Valley where many big companies taking wrong bets uh, took a dive. So uh, as uh, executive vice president strategy, uh, the top team led by me had to find business with longer product life cycle, where our strengths in, from the computer industry like service would be critical to success. And uh, choice was medical technology business. Since I had the strongest conviction uh, that this is the right business for the Wipro uh, group, uh, Wipro, Wipro corporate to enter, the responsibility to shape this strategy in the initial period was assigned to me. And uh, with, with the partner selection process, we uh, we hit upon GES as the partner to source technology and to do a joint venture. And I was selected the first CEO of the G joint venture. And that joint venture was mandated to make G number one or number two in the Indian market ethically in five years. Having achieved it in four years, I went on to work in GE USA in uh, growing the GE medical business in emerging markets. I did a three-year stint and created new opportunities for GE to grow in um, Eastern Europe, to grow in Asia, <coughs> including India. After three years in US, I came back to India as CEO of GE Medical System South Asia and uh, the goal this time was to make GE number one in the medical business. And not only that, to make the GE medical business in India a significant one. 
we set an aspirational goal of uh, the revenue of uh, $200 million by the year 2000. And uh, this meant a five-fold growth from 96 to 2000 in five years. Indian market alone could not take $200 million of uh, medical technological equipment at that time. So we also had to build export capabilities. And I'm happy to say that uh, we achieved this goal and pivoted the company from a local company for local market expansion to a global company for global uh, markets, uh, serving the global patient and serving the global market. So after completing my tenure in um, GE, I moved as chairman of GE's largest customer, Manipal, and ran hospitals and universities. Having unlocked uh, $500 million in value in three years, I went on to set up my own clinical research organization. I exited the business in 10 years in 2016 and became an investor and endowed money for a school of public health. Over to you, Ravi. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the story with the uh, joint venture with uh, GE. Uh, we're talking about uh, the late 70s, early 80s, correct? Uh, no, late uh, late 80s, early 90s. Okay, late 80s, early 90s. Okay, so uh, India is just on the cusp of opening up. How did you, how uh, hard was it? How easy was it uh, to persuade a company like GE to want to invest in this sector in India? See, the, the, the Indian economy had not opened up yet. But uh, GE leaders like Jack Welch uh, had a great, uh, they had taken a great bet on globalization. They had completed globalization of Europe, of an American company into Europe. And uh, they had also done a joint venture in Japan and Korea. So the next two countries which uh, had great attention of GE at that time was India and China. And uh, this, they realized the potential for India even before the Indian leaders themselves could dream of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what they were also convinced was that the uh, to succeed in India, which is a closed economy, you need a joint venture partner. So, uh, uh, so the uh, similarly for an Indian company to go into the medical technology, we needed a technological global partner, mm -hmm. and uh, so they, uh, the, 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 though we were not very clear about the criteria uh, when we were into joint venture negotiations, uh, the main thing uh, uh, G was looking for, or uh, companies like G were, were looking for, is that. Uh, the experience of the Indian company in the technology space and its track record in becoming a leader in that space with its own innovation initiatives and the like. Uh, uh, second, they, uh, they had a great emphasis that the partner should be running the business ethically. And... Uh, this is because you know U.S. companies were under the or are under and were under the scrutiny of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and anything done by a company which uh, they are associated and in which they have equity, if that's not done on ethical lines, it would pose great risk to the American company. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the two big criteria they were looking for was uh, a track record in the technology space to create market, and second was. Uh, the uh, business ethics with which uh, this could be accomplished. And so we had to work on both these uh, factors to convince G that uh, we are a, uh, we are a potentially a good partner for them to work with. And so that was one of the first things you did, and you did that uh, successfully. So you get on to the next step, which is now starting to implement the project. And I'm wondering at that time, and this is an issue in many developing countries, is do you have the technical talent in the country or do you have to do something special uh, as a company? You know, Because very often in emerging markets, 
uh, foreign companies have to do things that they don't have to do in the advanced countries where they have a you know steady or a, a ready made supply of talent and and so on so how did you did you have a challenge in creating a talent technical talent particularly technical talent pipeline to make products that hadn't been made in india before yes very much uh, see the non technical talent was provided by wipro okay. so the finance and hr and business development and all those things even sourcing and the like because they were in the computer business so there were certain similarities of technical uh, people who could do certain jobs and uh, g gave uh, one expatriate from bain consulting uh, mm -hmm. but uh, none of the people given by g or by wipro uh, there was domain knowledge and uh, to enter a business uh, for a company it's extremely important uh, to have people with domain knowledge so our most important resource to hire uh, was a person who had the trust of customers in this domain and who could open doors for a dialogue for our company so the first and foremost challenge we had was that attracting uh, this uh, key talent who could make a huge difference to the company's success and the speed of implementation so we uh, we, we zeroed in on a person by name sahu who was vice president mm -hmm. service in vice president service in siemens and uh, we had to put together a very attractive package for him to uh, be interested in uh, taking on this uh, startup challenge uh, more importantly you know we were very sensitive to his relocation from bombay to bangalore and uh, and one of the big challenges he faced was that his daughter was studying in a bombay university and she could not take a transfer to the bangalore university and she had never left home to any stay in any hostel and uh, my wife rajini found a good hostel for her Mm. through her network and uh, this kind of uh, support uh, he had not come across in his career mm. so i think you know he that was one of the factors which uh, which told him that this is a company with the difference which is trying to put all the variables uh, properly taken care for talent to join so that was at the top and uh, obviously at the at the operating level uh we had to do two things is that uh, we had to uh we had to attract some people from the industry and the industry was primarily you know distributors of uh, medical equipment and we had to pitch this uh, story to them that we are going to be not a distribution company we are going to go deep into manufacture deep into technology and and do things which are appropriate for the indian market so we could attract some of them but uh, mm. we had to create a strong campus program from where you know we could we had to take uh, biomedical engineers who we could train or we could take uh, electronic and software engineers who we could train in the medical domain and that was the pipeline we started with so this is the way we went about mm. Uh, and some of them went uh, were trained by ge outside india or in their foreign offices and locations or not uh this see the uh, more than outside india we had a number of trainers come from okay. uh, ge in europe and asia and the uh, us to india and spend uh, four days five days run intensive training programs and uh, okay. that could uh, provide the training to the whole batch versus we sending a few people abroad okay. perfect at the same time as you're building the talent for your own organization you're also working with your suppliers i would think because there are things that you uh, you can't make everything you need i assume for uh, these products and how advanced or sophisticated was the supplier base ecosystem back then uh, in india and did you have to do anything uh to develop that because i remember in the book you talk about reaching out to different uh, organizations uh, like bharat electronics uh, as an example and helping them 
uh, move up their technological capabilities to serve your needs? Sure. See, uh, the healthcare is uh, is normally perceived, the medical technology is normally perceived as a product business. Mm. But uh, what, after playing in the field, many people realize is that it is the infrastructure business. Mm. So it is, you have to have a strong service infrastructure. You have to have uh, part centers, you have to have part logistics, you have to have complex supply chain, local and global, to serve the customers. So our first step as a late entrant was to was to remove the doubt in customers mind whether Vipro G had the capability to commission expensive scanners and service them over life and remove the doubt in G's mind whether Vipro G can win orders ethically in a fiercely competitive market dominated by Siemens and Philips so our first task was to build a service team and a service supply chain then to go to market in that uh, environment uh, and to demonstrate that we can uh, we can win in this market, we segmented the market by buying ethics, opaque customers and transparent customers, and focused on the transparent ones and won them. This gave GE confidence to make scanners in India. And using less expensive local parts, Locally made scanners could cost to customer 20% less compared to our competitors who are importing the whole equipment. So, uh, so when you're know, talking of creating the supply chain and challenges, I think it is important for any company to start from what is the customer expectation. Our customers, doctors, asked us two questions. They had a choice. They could even they could either import a G scanner from Japan, or they could buy a G scanner which, which is less expensive but made in India. So when we asked them, uh, would you buy uh, the uh, the G scanner made in India? So they gave us two answers. One is that is the clinical information we get through image quality will it be same as the global scanner? because we don't want any compromise with our patients in the clinical information. Second, uh, the G Japan uh, scanners were known like Toyota cars as very reliable over product life cycle, hardly they break down. So the second question they had was that, will your product be as reliable as the product made in Japan? If the answer to both these questions is yes, then definitely we'll buy the Indian med scanner because it's less expensive. So in terms of our supply chain uh, strategy, we have to keep these two factors in mind. Now, the first factor, you know, is that uh, to achieve the same clinical excellence or same image quality as a, as a Japan scanner from GE. So in, a, in, in any scanner, the principle it operates is that you have a X-ray which is generated and uh, that goes through the human body. That X-ray when it comes out of the human body is detected for the changes it has undergone when it has passed through the human body. And that information is reconstructed on a, through algorithms using uh, printed circuit boards. And then it is displayed on the, on, on the monitor. So that is called the image chain. And we have to be extremely careful, not localizing things which we cannot assure quality in, in a short period of time. But we thought of all these items, uh, monitor, which is very similar to a computer monitor. We should go ahead and similarly printed circuit boards, we knew that we can make it coming from the electronic and computer industry. So we took upon ourselves that we'll do these two. But uh, when we approached our technology provider, G Japan, G Japan told that uh, they don't make the monitors. And so they will not be able to teach us how to make the monitor because they buy the monitor from a Japanese supplier. And so we had to use the good office and approach the Japanese supplier whether they could teach us how to make the medical monitor. So they looked at our capabilities and said that you will not be able to make it in a short period of time. It will take about three, four years. 
and we didn't have that time. So then we connected them to the best monitor maker in India. And we had to broker a marriage between uh, the Indian monitor maker and the Japanese monitor maker, and then give assured orders to the Indian monitor maker to buy technology from the Japanese monitor maker. And that was one of the good examples of uh, creating a hybrid supply chain, which would reduce cost, which would bring technology into the country, and we should make things uh, work. Now, the second aspect was uh, on reliability. And that's a tougher, uh, a tougher challenge to undertake because, see, reliability by, as an engineer, uh, I can say is that our common sense says that you do good testing. Then you can, you, you can screen out all defects and then give a defect-free product to the customer. But when our customer was talking of not reliability when you supply, he, they were talking of reliability over four or five years, that if there are latent defects in some parts, and if they show up after two years and the equipment stops, they said that never happens in the Japanese product. And can you make it happen in your product, in, your, in, in India-made product? So we had to really learn all uh, tricks of reliability engineering from Japan, but even then, we were not uh, very sure that uh, they have taught us all the uh, documented and undocumented uh, methods by which uh, Japan would, uh, would uh, achieve reliability. You know, a lot of reliability comes from experience of managing a large installed base over years. And when things, when equipment fail, there is a detailed analysis of why the equipment failed, what was the root cause, and how that root cause has to be eliminated. And uh, so what we thought was that uh, since it's impossible to be sure that all knowledge is transferred to us, we thought of an innovative idea. We asked Japan, why don't you use the Indian parts in the scanners you assemble and make in Japan? <laughs> so, you know, Japan did not, Japan was happy that the product cost would come down, <laughs> but they did not want to damage the reputation. So they did everything possible to teach us every trick in the trade to see that the Indian suppliers produce the same reliable reliability of parts which Japanese suppliers would produce. So mm. I think these are interesting things uh, which we did, which is out of the box and which is not necessarily the way every company would go about. Uh, mm. So I think working backwards from the customer, understanding what is most important and uh, developing the solutions for those expectations was the fundamental way in which we went about creating supply chain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things I remember from the book is the, how you have to really shape the context in which you operate. You don't just take the world as given, but in many ways you have to uh, create a world around you that makes it possible for you to succeed. So developing your supplier by tying them up with another supplier in Japan uh, is, is a classic uh, example. If you say my job is to only do things that happen within the four walls of my company, then you won't succeed, right? Sure. And you certainly showed a lot of creative uh, problem solving uh, along the way. Um, speak a little bit about you know the uh, the cost reduction um, that India has become famous for. Uh, you've given us examples of how you lowered the cost, for instance, substituting foreign components with Indian uh, components is one way uh, to achieve it. But is that enough to bring prices down and costs down by 50% or something of that order of magnitude? Uh, what else do you have to do to really push the cost to the point where the product becomes uh, truly affordable for the mass market segment in a country like India? Sure. So, uh, you know, once again, we were driven by the, uh, the market dynamics. As I told you, by winning ethical customers, we could get a market share of 10%. But to become number one or number two, we had to get a market share of 25-30%. Now, we found that fighting in metros for these customers was uh, expensive. Uh, was difficult to steal the market share from competition. So we said that uh, 
uh, why not uh, you know why not we uh, go and create a market outside the bombay delhi uh, chennai etc similar to for example if you are successful in selling in new york chicago la and if you want to sell in atlanta or florida some place where the conditions are quite different and uh, and and the concentration of economic buying power is not there in many many geographies like that and so we uh, we 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 found that uh, there were there was a lot of unmet demand of patients and there were aspiring uh, medical medical doctors like radiologists who wanted to put up scanners but the situation there was that uh, they could attract patients at uh, if the fee per scan was far less than in bombay or in delhi if in bombay or delhi fee per scan uh, you could get many patients as 100 dollars they said we can get a similar number of patients in the uh, second level towns only if you reduce the price to 40 dollars to get a 60% drop in uh, in price you know it's not possible uh, just through product and uh, we we had to think what else we had to do and so we had to study the whole customer context the customer was buying a scanner he was creating a, a scanner room he was creating a workflow he was creating uh, uh, printers he was creating uh, training of people he was spending a lot of money on a lot of things and finally the product cost uh, would be less than 50% in his total setup to make the scanner as a diagnostic center so mm-hmm. we said that uh, can we bring the cost of the total scanner room by 60% rather than just the product and so we had to focus and uh, do things on things which is normally not done by a medtech company like for example if a film printer is there which is bought from somewhere we had to brainstorm with the radiologist as to in what other ways the film printing cost can be reduced and the like so mm-hmm. i think uh, uh, we did well and we could uh, we could solve several hurdles in the way we brought the scanner room cost we brought the consumer consumable cost down we got the scanner productivity up we brought the finance cost down in every area we had to pioneer new solutions and a new supply chain new engineering new innovation so anybody who works in the medtech industry the the our experience was that innovation is not should not be restricted to inside the company and on the product alone a lot of scope is there to understand the customer context and help the customer to bring the total cost down and uh, mm-hmm. since we were successful uh, we also uh, in this process built a, a medical technology ecosystem of consumables and many things and we gained 25% market share and became number 2 in the market within 3 years now the the next uh, uh, challenge faced by the customer was that the customer uh, has to be competitive over the product life cycle of the scanner is bought which is 4 to 5 years now a major part of the cost of uh, operating a medical technology product is the consumables and service so uh, the biggest consumable cost in ct is a ct tube and uh, ct tube uh, we could not make it at india volumes so we were constantly looking out for any opportunity which would uh, get more volumes and if there is an opportunity to make in india bring the cost down and make our customer more competitive than uh, his competition which may have philips and siemens uh, scanners second uh, uh, important factor was that once a customer is loyal to you using your equipment and enjoying the fruits of that over 4 5 years he would like to give you the first chance to buy the successor product and if you throw that opportunity away 
all the work you have done for so many years is a waste. So we had to come up with the next generation product. And the next generation product, obviously GE would have many next generation products for the global market. But we wanted to come up with something which is particularly suited to India. For example, the scanner we were uh, we were brought into the country and localized. If we could reduce the cost by 50% and reduce the size of the scanner by 50%, we could take such a product into more interior geographies of India and expand the market significantly. And we said, but that this type of uh, so-called super economy product did not interest GE so much. So they uh, they said that uh, you know to to even make a super economy product to require ten million dollars, and we don't we have already allocated the our uh, development budget on uh, premium markets, and so we don't have money. If you can develop this product with your own profits, we will uh, let you will support you. But you know ten million dollars profit we did not have. We had best said. $1 million profit, which can be set aside for R&D. And so over two years, we set aside $2 million and took up on the challenge of making a product for the Indian market, for expanding and creating an Indian market in an affordable product, which is which goes deeper and deeper into the geography. And uh, that was a huge success. And... Uh, and you know, uh, and and then the vocabulary in the industry uh, came of an affordable product, an accessible product, and uh, the 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 concept of frugal innovation, because GE was stunned how a ten million dollar program we could do in two million dollars. What we had done was that a lot of repurposing technologies available within GE and, and available in the open space and use it uh, smartly and intelligently and innovatively to create the new product. And uh, so we also became uh, a, a laboratory within GE for frugal innovation, for creating affordable products and uh, finding ways and means to make it accessible to patients in remote areas. Yeah, I, I mean, we can go on. Uh, there are lots, so, so many things you've said that I, I uh, wish I could uh, probe further, but I, I see we have already run through half the time, and okay. I want to be sure that we give questions, time for qu uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I, I see one here uh, that asks, um, and let's see, um, what are the common differences in the last 20 years in terms of business ethics, customer loyalty, and customer retention? And maybe this is, you know, some of this period you were not actually in uh, GE Wipro any, anymore, uh, but you certainly are an you know, observer, observer of the Indian business uh, landscape and you know all the people involved. H has it become, I guess the question, I guess, is it, it, how has the business environment in India changed in the last 10 or 15 years compared to the previous 10 or 15 years, especially, I think, in the, along the dimensions of uh, being ethical and uh, you call it the transparent versus non-transparent. Is that ratio changing? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think uh, uh, I, I, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, lot lot of flack faced by politicians, not because of ethical or unethical uh, conduct, but because if the investment made by governments in in public health infrastructure does not provide service to poor patients. The poor patients are up in arms. And when the poor patients are up in arms, it creates a fund of political ill will for the ministers and for the party in power and the like. So some of that type of heat, which uh, has come through patient activism, has, mm -hmm. uh, has made many, many progressive state governments think of innovative with business models to see that uh, the patient is served. The patient is served better, the patient is taken care, and uh, the uh, the challenges and problems within uh, 
the buying process and other things are are overcome by you know what you can call a workaround workarounds whereby you government doesn't take the responsibility to buy but uh, delegates it in a business model where a private party uh, uh, buys the technology provides a service and government provides patients and infrastructure and this model has been very successful and uh, g was uh, the innovator of this business model and uh, that has uh, led to uh, disintermediation of government in buying medical technology in government hospitals and uh, now one of the clinical service operators who has been successful and introduced by g today runs 2500 government hospitals with the uh, medical technology equipment he has bought so you can imagine that the, the type of change is phenomenal it's not small it's not incremental Mm. Now that was a, I think, a, sounds like a really brilliant move, because you uh, you create a larger market of uh, transparent uh, buyers, which is which was your uh, goal. And certainly, the company you're talking about, Krishna Diagnostics, is going to be featured in our uh, startup event on the 28th of October. Uh, and we had you and I had the pleasure of visiting their facilities in Pune last month or, or a few weeks back. uh but that that whole business model i think is something many uh, countries can learn from where it's a kind of a public private partnership and the facilities are in a government hospital but owned by the private uh, service provider to whom you sell the equipment so you don't deal with the government you deal with the private provider who deals with the government uh, by using their facilities and uh, and but is uh, charging prices that are set by the government so it's a very interesting model um there's another question here from dr anand which i'm going to ask but before i do i want to mention that my colleague at northeastern professor lee makowski uh, if he's still on the on the call lee if you have any questions you want to ask prasanna because uh, you're trying to help develop the medical device industry in ghana uh, and you are a biomedical engineer so you know the technology very well uh, please uh, just uh, jump in and raise your hand and you can ask the question directly Now, Dr. Yes. Anand would like yeah, to. Yeah, Dr. Prasad, ah. thank you very much. Okay, go I'm ahead. I'm just saying hello for now. Hello. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'm going to ask the question from Dr. Uh, Dr. Anand, and then uh, Lee, if you have a question, please uh, jump in. So, Anand is uh, asking, how long does it take to create? Uh, he says, "Let me read the question." Trust is an important fa- facet of cross-border partnerships, especially in the supply chain example that you talked about. may I ask how how much time did this take to implement also any other risks that you overcome in the hybrid partnership model now hybrid partnership model uh, this uh, the one of the risks is that you have to make a call whether he whether your volumes are big enough for that supplier to be exclusive to you so sooner or later he will come back and say i want to supply philips the monitors i want to supply siemens the monitors and all the work you have done in bringing this competitiveness to india you are going to give it away to your competitors i think you know one has to have a broad uh, broad mindset when you go about doing things like this you are pioneering things and you are creating a national infrastructure if you can take advantage of it as long as you can find but uh, we should not just uh, limit them from giving that capacity giving that competence to every player in the field so that overall finally the more patients benefit now um i see a question here from our common friend old time friend bala chakravarti you remember him he was <laughs> uh, he was also worked in tata group Uh, like you and Tas at one point, yeah. Bala. Nice to have you, Bala. Do you want to ask the question yourself? Thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prasanna, for a thank you, Bala. Um, I'm sorry. Can you not hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Go ahead. Uh, th- this is about uh, customer-led innovation. It's a great story. It's also innovation beyond the product. to cover the entire what's called the innovation piano keyboard you know touching about 
supply chain and various things. The, the big question is you achieve this and there's a sense of accomplishment. How do you do this repeatedly? And you did talk about, uh, you know, uh, success is not just uh, over a three year period. Uh, how do you sustain it? What do you do organizationally to make it happen? That's a very, very interesting question because uh, that takes us to how do you build an innovation culture in the organization? And uh, innovation culture in the organization, I have a few steps. Uh, if you allow me, yeah, Ravi, if you allow me, I will uh, mm. walk through those steps. Please. I think, uh, you know, innovation comes when you stretch your mind. So it is the first, uh, first thing that should happen in any organization is that the leader should set aspirational goals. But you cannot set aspirational goals on a one-year horizon. You have to set it on a four, five-year horizon and constantly uh, chase it and year by year, step by step, make it happen. So this is the first step. The second step is that uh, you should instill a mindset in the whole organization that uh, it is very important to compare your operational uh, excellence with external competition. So, you know, all of us know benchmarking. So the, the, the organization must be encouraged to benchmark itself into levels of excellence to be best in the industry, best in the country, best in the world, uh, to, uh, to see that, uh, you know, to get there, you innovate. To get there, you do things uh, differently. You know, we had a situation when we were building the, the business in the initial period. I wanted that this uh, mindset is instilled in our employees, but neither we had a, a locally made product nor we had the full factory established. We were building the campus. So uh, what uh, I encouraged my team was that uh, let us uh, uh, try to win uh, the best campus garden trophy by benchmarking our campus garden with other campus gardens of other factories in Bangalore. And to do this, you know, the team had to go and find out how the competition ran, what uh, what did the winners do in the previous year, who are the current competitors, what we should do, and what we should do with the horticulturist, gardener and the like. And so the whole mindset came as to how do you do even in things like that, uh, benchmarking and uh, achieving excellence. And I'm happy to say that we got the uh, the Urban Art Award for our campus. And that sort of thing instilled a sense of uh, benchmarking right from the beginning. The third aspect I would uh, uh, re-emphasize is that the, the organization must be trained to delight customers. And, and, you, and delighting customers is not through deep discounts. If you do that, the company is destroyed. So there are several ways of delighting customers. And in my book, I explain many, many ways in which uh, many, many examples in many industries I give. And uh, it is possible to create that training within the organization that every wing of the organization must work towards delighting the customer. Then the, the next uh, step would be to focus on how to get extraordinary performance from ordinary people. Now, this is the job of the leader. You know, you cannot uh, get all uh, IIT people or MIT people or uh, the Harvard MBAs or the IIM MBAs to come and work for you. So you will have a small group of those uh, brilliant people, but a majority of people who would come from the, the mass uh, talent pool available in the, in the country. So how do you get from them extraordinary performance? I think, uh, you know, it is uh, mentoring is one important way. And uh, leading by example is very, very important for leadership and uh, motivating people through many means. I talked about customer delight, benchmarking and the like, constantly helps people to aim high. The fact that we have, we have set aspirational goals itself uh, makes you uh, makes you uh, work towards innovative methods. 
The other thing which is important uh, for every leader realizes is that there is no substitute for hard work. When you have challenging goals, when you have uh, pioneering ways to overcome problems, you have to work not only smartly, but also you have to stretch yourself and work hard. Now, this poses immediately a work-life balance issue with the family. That uh, where the family members feel that company is the villain who is taking away the, uh, the working partner's life, time away from them. So you have to, if you cannot get people to stretch and uh, do uh, things in the company without this spouse support. And it is the job of companies to create in the spouse a communication as to what the company is doing, how it is progressing, how it's a good company, how it's a good team, and how it is uh, working for a good purpose. I think all these things, uh, when you take effort to build that uh, ethos in the company and the family, there is a much more uh, leeway given by the family to take on that extra travel which may be required to go to a customer to find out why something is working or not working. And those things are required for innovation and you cannot do without that. And another thing which is uh, not, uh, which is lost in large companies is that, you know, you can get a lot by leveraging national pride. For example, you know, if you do, uh, there are so many things of national pride in US. There are so many things of national pride in Japan, in Korea, in India. And uh, how do you leverage employees' employees' sense of national pride for the good of innovation and for the good of the company? For that, I think, you know, the company should participate in a national uh, competition. For example, if you win a, a Malcolm uh, Balbridge Award in quality, automatically your name would be flashed. If you win a Deming Prize in Japan, the quality uh, 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 image would go up and the like. And so it's very important that companies also pay attention to not only uh, the, you know participating in global competitions, but participating in national competitions and creating that national pride. So I think these are some of the cultural aspects which facilitate innovation. And if this innovation mindset is built, you can sustain innovation in the organization, uh, product life cycle after product life cycle. I think uh, uh, that's the answer, Vinkitesh, uh, for your question. Hmm. Bala. Yeah. Bala. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to give Lee Bukowski, my colleague, who's trying to take lessons from here and apply them in Ghana. Uh, Lee, <laughs> please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Prasanna. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your views on, on developing the biomedical uh, device industry in India. We've been working with healthcare workers in, in Ghana for uh, five or six years now, and it, it's clear that they suffered dramatically from a, a, situ a market where 95% of all of their materials, devices, and supplies come from outside the country. And one of the many advantages of, of uh, producing the instruments inside the country is the ability to have local expertise, both for maintenance and training. And you haven't said very much about training, it, and, but you have talked a lot about penetrating secondary markets in India. And I would have thought you'd have to have quite an effort to uh, train new healthcare workers who are unfamiliar with your uh, devices, how to work there. How, how did that work? And how does that integrate into your into your glo global vision of, of building this industry? See, uh, we have, in, we in have, this industry, uh, Prasanna, we have 10 minutes left. I want to see if we can get at least two more questions. Okay, okay, okay. I will yeah. be uh, I will be right to the point. Uh, yeah. In the medical industry, the important uh, uh, people who are role models and examples are the luminaries. So there are local luminaries, there are global luminaries. I think uh, to build the competency for in healthcare workers to operate sophisticated technology, it's important to engage the luminaries to devote time to train the new people. And uh, second is that uh, uh, apart from this, you know, you have to run university programs and the like, where there's a pipeline coming of new uh, biomedical talent, new 
allied health uh, talent new medical technologists who are made familiar with the needs of the industry great thank you thank you thank you uh, I, I think uh, dawn who's one of the other attendees has a question quite similar and I think she's asking, what are the lessons, and this may not be fair to ask you, uh, what are the lessons you think Africa can take from your uh, experience? See, uh, one of the challenges in uh, medical technology is uh, it's not just the product. There are a lot of consumables. It could be as simple as bandages. It could be sutures. It could be so many things which are used in the in, in the hospital. Now, if you try to develop uh, without a proper infrastructure, a sophisticated medical device, it may be too big a challenge to climb. But if we can produce, uh, if you could substitute a Johnson & Johnson expensive medical consumable with a consumable made in Ghana, made in Africa, I think it is doable. So when you start doing those things, you develop a certain uh, ecosystem and then you can scale it up to more sophisticated things. That would be my advice uh, uh, to Africa. Okay. Uh, you you uh, alluded to the exports that you were able to begin to generate. Uh, I, I, I think it'd be nice if you could spend maybe a couple, just a few minutes on that issue because, you know, India has a large merchandise trade deficit, which is basically funded by services, exports, and a transfer, you know, remittances and so on. Uh, but now India is trying to ramp up its exports, and you have shown that it is possible, except that, you know, it doesn't happen in a big enough scale. How did you? managed to get exports to becoming almost, what is it, half the total revenues? So I think, you know, the, again, as I told you, innovation comes by setting uh, aspirational targets. Uh, when we were $40 million, we set an aspirational target to become a $200 million company, and that could not be done without exports. So the entire organization was searching for what we need to do to uh, to do to do global globally sellable products. So at every opportunity it was seized, it was converted uh, through hard work into products which could be marketed. So when uh, this uh, enthusiasm was seen by people like JP Mel, they started uh, throwing global problems at the Indian team and asking them, can you take this challenge and make it work? That is, for example, there was a factory in Belgium which was uh, uh, which was uh, completely unionized and uh, the very high wage, wage cost. And but the product was an outstanding product, but was not profitable. So Jeff asked us uh, that can you take this product and do it in half the cost, and also in terms of the uh, time we can reduce the time by half, and we did that by various means. And and similarly. Uh, he had a strategy of acquisition of uh, products loved by customers, but made by companies who are not profitable. He would acquire the company and ask India that, uh, can you take over engineering and manufacturing and reduce the cost dramatically to make these products loved by customers also profitable? And we did that. So when we gave solutions to global problems, our exports automatically grew. So this was an advantage being a part of a multinational, but I think you know any company is working in a global system can find ways and means of doing this. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, did, in the time you were in GE, were you also doing any R&D for uh, new products that GE was planning to introduce globally or did that come later with the R&D center in Bangalore? Jack Welch uh, Center. No, no, we uh, see the, the thing is like this. For example, I told you we did a scanner which was half the cost and which go, which went into more remote, remote markets. Now that product, we could sell $30 million in India. But when similar 
situations or market situations were found in the world by GE. The product sold $300 million globally. Hmm. So this is what I mean in my book that innovate locally to win globally. Because the problems of India may not be existing in all 150 countries of the world, but will be existing in 30, 40 countries of the world. And you have to find who those, which those countries are and apply the solution, modify it, and export the product to that country. Of course, you know, hit a soft spot for me, which is the reverse innovation uh, idea <laughs> that, that you have actually lived through and uh, implemented. Uh, because a solution for a billion people in India is also potentially a solution for four or five billion people around the world. So if you can find that answer in India, then there's an opportunity to take it to uh, other parts of the world. And as a multinational firm, GE is well positioned uh, to help uh, help with the diffusion of that uh, those uh, innovations. It's a terrific uh, story. What do you see as India now aspires to get into other tech uh, industries? whether it's batteries or uh, semiconductors or uh, EVs, uh, solar, and so on, uh, where they want to actually localize uh, production. What ad advice would you give the planners and the company executives who are trying to do that? I think it's very important uh, to, uh, to get core technology, learn the core technology of any sector you want to be in. If uh, if we are peripheral and say just we'll do the last stage before the customer receives it, like final assembly or some fabrication and the like, versus the earliest stages, which, uh, which allow the country to go deeper into technology, uh, then it is like, you know, countries like India making uh, planes. You make a plane, that is out of uh, uh, out of uh, model. Then you again go and buy another technology, make another plane. So that should not be the approach. If you are serious about semiconductor industry or solar panel industry, we have to understand. We have to go deep into technology and truly imbibe technology and develop technology and progress the technology further in parallel to making the product in the country for the country's market or for the global market. I think uh, mm. in many of those things, scale is important. So I think uh, initially partnering with a global uh, current leader will be important, but uh, progressively you should be able to have competitive advantage more than the current global leader to be able to win the global market. And it is up to the next generation of Indian entrepreneurs, leaders, engineers uh, to carry the baton that uh, you have passed on to them. Uh, sure. So Prasanna, our time is uh, almost up. Uh, I want to thank you for your service uh, to building these industries in India, but also for this wonderful book, Innovate Locally to Win Globally. It has a lot of uh, granular information on how all of this was accomplished over decades. So my takeaway is that, you know, this kind of uh, technology intensive industry requires a multi-decade effort, it does not happen uh, overnight. Uh, and it takes people with uh, the grit and the perseverance of people like Prasanna to make it happen. Uh, but uh, in the, in, over a period of time, it actually helps build not only technological capabilities, but also the capacity to uh, adapt and find solutions that are appropriate for the local context. Uh, so it's a wonderful journey to embark on and uh, hopefully many developing countries can learn from your experience. Uh, thank you again, Prasanna. Before uh, I, I sign off, I just want to remind our audience here, we have on the 16th of October, the CEO of FedEx coming to uh, the center to speak about uh, digital first strategy at FedEx. So if you interest in that topic and how FedEx is planning to adapt to all the changes in the global economy. Please join us in person if you're in Boston or you can watch it online it's on the 16th of October. And on the 28th of October, we're doing the next, uh, this year's India Summit uh, focused on startups, which very nicely ties into some of the things that Prasanna has talked about. 
So we hope we'll see many of you at uh, those events. Uh, one, one more time, Prasanna, thank you. So thank, thank you, Ravi. Thanks, everyone who have participated. And I enjoyed speaking to you. Wonderful. And I know it's late in the evening for you, so <laughs> thank you for doing that. And to all our friends from India who have joined, thank you for staying up uh, to join us today. Uh, with that, uh, wish you all the best and see you at one of our future events. Thank you. Bye-bye.